The Subcommittee on Environment will come to order. Good morning, everybody. Um, this should actually be, hopefully, a, uh, an interesting, and um, uh, the doctor has actually been one of the committee's favorites because we've considered you to always be very forthcoming in discussion. So it's appreciated having you here. Um, you know, today, today's hearing entitled An Overview of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Budget Request for the 2015 Fiscal Year. In front of you are packets containing the written testimony, biographies, truth and testimony disclosures of today's witnesses. I'd like to recognize myself for a few minutes here and we'll just get ourselves going. Um, NOAA's 2015 budget request is $5.5 billion, which is an increase of, what, 3.3% from the 2014. Um, some of the questions that I believe you'll be um, hearing today are going to revolve around the satellite program and continuing to increase as a percentage of your, of your total budget. My understanding now is it will consume about 40% of NOAA's budget. Um, and in the 2015 budget request, $2.2 billion for NOAA's sa satellite office. Um, the two main satellite systems are the Joint Polar System. Um, I think we refer to it as what, JPSS? And the Geostationary Operational Environmental st Satellite, the GOES. Two satellites provide up to 90% of the critical data needed to make our weather forecasts. I would like some discussion um, from whether it be from questions or you, Dr. Sullivan. Is there going to be a gap? And how will that gap be fulfilled? And are there, what optionality is there? Is there a private optionality? And how long the expected gap in that data? Um, the second thing that I believe you'll have multiple questions on is in regards to the supercomputing power and the ability to uh, manage the scale and the size of the data you have considering the current holds that are out there because of the contract with IBM and the sale to China. Um, and I know many of us have, would like to discuss with you what options are there. Um, and I, as Dr. Sullivan, as you're speaking, I would love you, for you to go a little further from our previous conversation of sharing with us sort of the mechanics you already have in place with universities and private industry of management of data, speed of data, um, and total bulk time that you have for your supercomputing and your collection of crowd data. And with that, I would like to recognize Ms. Bonamici, the ranking member. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this morning's hearing and to examine the President's budget request for NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I'd welcome back Dr. Sullivan and congratulate you on being uh, named one of Time Magazine's uh, 100 Most Influential uh, People. That's a very nice article and some very nice words from Senator Glenn. Uh, as we face, uh, find ourselves facing one of the biggest environmental challenges of our time, climate change, we're in need of your national leadership and advocacy on this issue as well as other important issues under NOAA's jurisdiction. I thank you very much for being here and I'm looking forward to today's discussion about NOAA's priorities. NOAA is a critically important agency uh, with helping our communities, our economy, and our ecosystems remain healthy and resilient in the face of an ever-shifting environment. NOAA conducts state-of-the-art research to understand and predict changes in weather and climate as well as in the oceans and along our coasts. This science is used to create products and services that inform decision making by a diverse set of stakeholders. NOAA helps my constituents along the coast of Oregon decide when it's safe to go out fishing. They aid my constituents in Yamhill County as they grow grapes that become Oregon's world famous Pinot Noir. They assist people in Oregon and across the country in planning for and responding to extreme weather and climate events like heavy precipitation, flooding, and the devastating storms impacting the South and the Midwest. And NOAA helps all of our constituents in similar ways. I'm pleased that the President's budget request recognizes the importance of NOAA and gives the agency a prominent role in the administration's efforts to prepare the United States for the impacts of climate change. 
The budget makes critical investments in NOAA's observational infrastructure, which includes environmental satellites that not only serve as the foundation for our weather forecast, but also provide critical information about the opening of the Arctic Circle to maritime commerce and energy development. The proposed budget also recognizes that the demand for climate data and other information, especially at the regional level, is growing. It seeks to address this need for regional information and tools by expanding NIDIS, the National Integrated Drought Information System, to include, among other areas, the Pacific Northwest. By improving our understanding of ocean acidification, which will help the shellfish industry adapt and the fishing industry prepare, and by operationalizing ecological forecasting of harmful algal blooms that pose a threat to human health. Overall, I'm pleased with the President's budget request for NOAA, but do have some concerns I would like to briefly mention. Specifically, uh, as the Chairman noted, although the Joint Polar Satellite System, or JPSS, seems to be on track, and in fact it was recently announced that the first of five instruments that will fly on JPSS-1 is ready for installation, I do remain concerned about the risks associated with a likely gap in polar data and NOAA's plans to mitigate the impact of the gap. I hope to gain a better understanding today of the agency's uh, efforts to implement a mitigation plan. Additionally, as you know, uh, off the west coast lies the Cascadia subduction zone. When, unfortunately not if, but when another earthquake occurs on this fault, it will trigger, trigger a massive tsunami with potentially catastrophic results. I'm sure you can understand uh, my concern and that of my constituents with the proposed elimination of education and awareness grants through the National Tsunami Hazard Mitigation Program. Grants that are designed to help communicate threats to vulnerable communities and assist in the development of response strategies. I'd like to hear from you, Dr. Sullivan, about how NOAA is working to increase resiliency in communities threatened by tsunamis, and I look forward to working with you as we develop legislation to reauthorize the Tsunami Warning and Education Act. Mr. Chairman, thank you again for holding this hearing. I look forward to working with you and our colleagues to ensure that NOAA has the resources it needs to fulfill its critical mission to protect lives and property and to enable commerce through science, service, and stewardship. Dr. Sullivan, thank you again for being here and for your service to the nation. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ranking Member Bonamici. Um, now we'd like to recognize um, Chairman Smith, the Chairman of the Full Committee, for unlimited amount of time. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Administrator Sullivan, for being with us here today. And let me congratulate you on being named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People of 2014. Our committee oversees NOAA's more than $5 billion budget. NOAA is responsible for critical science activities related to oceans, weather, and climate. Today we are here to discuss the President's Fiscal Year 15 budget request for NOAA of $5.5 billion, a 3.3 percent increase over 2014 levels. While I support many of these areas of research and forecasting, other parts of the President's budget request are harder to justify. For example, the Administration's request substantially increases funding for climate research and for some non-critical climate satellite activities but funding for the National Weather Service and weather forecasting research is essentially flat. Almost $190 million is requested for climate research, more than twice the amount dedicated to weather research. There are 13 other agencies that are involved in climate change research, and according to the Congressional Research Service, they have spent $77 billion between 2008 and 2013. Unfortunately, NOAA's models do not match up with observed changes and have not predicted regional climate changes. And NOAA's website, climate.gov, includes non-peer-reviewed materials for children that, in my view, promote climate alarmism. These misguided priorities are troubling. Instead of hyping climate alarmism, NOAA should focus its efforts on other areas, such as improving weather forecasting. America's leadership has slipped in severe weather forecasting, and European weather models routinely predict America's weather better than we can. I'm also concerned that NOAA's satellite division now comprises over 40 percent of the total budget request for the agency at over $2 billion. In 2008, the satellite budget came in under a billion dollars and was roughly one quarter of NOAA's overall spending. The budget for this office has ballooned dramatically over the last decade. For instance, the Joint Polar Satellite System program has been plagued with runaway cost and mismanagement, which raises questions about future funding for the project and its expected launch dates. Uh, 
Even NOAA's own optimistic schedule would still leave us with a gap for critical weather data in the middle part of this decade. Meanwhile, the chronic cost overruns of NOAA satellites have forced significant reductions in funding for important activities in areas such as oceans, fisheries, and weather. NOAA is a mission-oriented agency, and this committee supports these core priorities. We face fiscal constraints that force us to make difficult choices about our science and technology resources. Rather than devoting limited dollars to duplicative and alarmist climate change activities, NOAA, in my view, should focus on research and forecasting capabilities that do, in fact, protect lives and property. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now you're back, but uh, on the way to yielding back, uh, let me apologize to the administrator. I have a Judiciary Committee markup uh, that began 25 minutes ago. I'm going to have to tend to, and then I hope to uh, return in time to ask questions. So yield back. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our witness today is the Honorable Catherine Sullivan, Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and Administrator of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. And let, I want to make sure the committee also congratulates you on recently being confirmed as the Administrator for NOAA and also being named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in 2014, which I think all of us have now mentioned. <laughs> We all wanted to make sure we got that in. There's no envy there at all. Um, previously, Dr. Sullivan served as Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Environmental Observation and Predictions, as well as performing the duties of NOAA's chief scientist. She is a distinguished scientist, renowned astronaut, intrepid explorer. We'll later find out what that is. And Dr. Sullivan, you earned your doctorate in um, geology. Um, Dr. Sullivan, you have five minutes, and I believe you know the routine. Yellow light, talk faster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Bonamici, members of the committee. Uh, first, before starting my testimony, I want to express my condolences to all of those who are touched by the severe weather that swept through many states over the past four days. Our NOAA forecasters and staff are on the front lines in such events providing warnings and information to their neighbors, your constituents, that help them avoid, cope with, and become ready, weather ready in the face of this fearsome power of nature. I'm proud of the work they do. In recent events, they gave stakeholders accurate outlooks six days in advance and timely warnings thanks to the reliable environmental intelligence our Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma produces. We know there is still more that can be done, and I will need your help with that, as I have detailed in my written statement. I am here today to talk about the President's FY15 proposal for the, for the NOAA budget. Uh, I, like you, believe that NOAA is one of the most important and valuable service agencies in the United States government. Our enterprise of observing systems, forecasts, and assessments is designed to provide the foresight and information people need to live safely and well on this dynamic planet. And it works. At NOAA, we call this information environmental intelligence, and producing it is at the core of our mission. The environmental intelligence and related decision support services that NOAA provides are in higher demand today than ever before, from forecasting short-term extreme weather events to providing the data that help ensure safe navigation and the smooth flow of commerce to sustaining and promoting economically viable fisheries. This budget request makes disciplined and targeted investments to sustain and advance these critical missions. For now, I'd like to emphasize just three important areas, investment areas in the budget. First, NOAA's global observing systems are the indispensable foundation of our nation's environmental intelligence. This budget proposes disciplined, targeted investments in that infrastructure. And I would highlight for the moment NOAA's fleet of research vessels. Without investments now, our fleet will shrink by 50% by 2028, which will severely degrade stock assessments, nautical charting, buoy maintenance, and research. That is why we, we request funding for a new multi-use ocean survey vessel that can work in any ocean with greater data gathering capability than current NOAA vessels. Second, communities and businesses are demanding NOAA's environmental information over many timescales to help them protect assets and plan for the future. We must keep pace with this demand. This budget invests in the data and information services that promote community and economic resilience in advance of and in the aftermath of severe events. In the FY15 budget, we propose targeted increases that will help build capacity for response and resilience in the critical need areas of coastal inundation and drought, 
ecological forecasting of harmful algal blooms, and the understanding of potential environmental impacts from increasing commerce in the Arctic. Third, we must be able to attract and retain the best talent to ensure that NOAA can effectively engage with our partners and efficiently deliver environmental intelligence. To do this, we must invest in our people and the administrative services that support them. I am keenly focused on achieving organizational excellence within NOAA. No business can succeed if its essential support services fall behind the pace and the demand of the outside world. But that's just what has begun to happen at NOAA. One data point to illustrate. As of FY12, NOAA has one human resources representative serving 150 employees. Looking at comparable agencies like NIST, the Coast Guard, and NASA, NOAA is underfunded by almost one-third. And our capacity is, some only about, is 40 percent below that of the average U.S. company, according to data recently published in the Wall Street Journal. We must reverse this trend if the agency is to function at the level that our citizens, the Congress, and our customers and partners demand. I look forward to working with the members of this committee and our partners and constituents to achieve the goals we articulate through the implementation of our FY15 budget. And I thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. I want to thank our witness and um, reminding all members that our rules limit us to five minutes. I'm going to give myself five minutes here. And um, a couple of the questions we, I touched with you in regards to the opening statement. Let's sort of walk through them. Um, explain to me and help me understand um, what has been referred to as sort of the satellite coverage gap and what is being done to mitigate that and what optionality do you have? The, uh, the prospect of the gap, Mr. Chairman, uh, arises from the, the recasting of satellite programs back in 2009 and regaining a smooth production cadence, budget control, schedule control, and cost control. We have those now well in hand on the polar program. When you look at the projected lifetimes of the current assets in orbit and the time to deliver the new ones, the statistical analyses with different, uh, prob different assumptions say, gee, you might not get there in time. So we are laser focused on four key things. We are managing the current on-orbit assets to maximize the likelihood. We are going to stick the JPSS-1 launch date in the past 18 to 20 months of schedule and budget uh, performance, I believe, indicate we're on the right track to do now, that. Now, Doctor, within that point, um, what do you think the gap will be? Well, we can spend probably this whole hearing block and many others, Mr. Schweikert, debating statistical assumptions that would give you different analysis. Just your best guess. Uh, I, I, I'm not even focusing on what the best guess is because it's also fluid. St statistical analyses can be slanted or come up with all sorts of answers. I'm focusing on manage the asset we have to protract its life and stick the launch date. In addition, we're focused on the mitigation plans that we've discussed with this committee and other members of the Congress in the past year. And that is understand what, if any, additional data sources could be brought online as a hedge against a gap. What improvements to our forecast enterprise could we make to lessen the impact of a gap should we have one? and a whole plethora of other activities that we've detailed in prior that, that pleases me to hear that um, within your optionality, we'll use that word again, um, you will also look at what other sources might be out there, what other data could be purchased, or even short-term satellite coverage. We are looking at that. Our criterion, of course, would be viable, proven capability to deliver in the time frame required. Okay. Um, uh, doctor, just because it's it's area of interest and in being down to two minutes and 40 seconds, I wanted to um, talk to me about what you believe the future of data gathering is, particularly as you and I have already started to discuss sort of the crowdsourcing of data and all the instruments that we all now carry in our lives, whether it be our cars or handheld computers, those who have home weather stations. What does that mean to you and what is that future and what does it bring to you? Uh, that, that's a trend that's overtaking all of us, and we're watching very carefully. Uh, I, my own view is it's going to play out on a number of different fronts. If you look at uh, during a, a severe weather event, NOAA and other partners already do crowdsource data. We get rain reports, snow reports, tornado reports from people on the ground through social media. The delivery of a measurement directly from a cell phone into the production weather model, I think, will take a longer time to attain. Uh, there's work yet to be done to really be sure we understand how to handle the various reliabilities, various precisions that that uh, 
menagerie of instrumentation uh, might have. I think the progress and solution we may eventually make to that will come through a combination of both government, academic, and private sector efforts. Uh, and it's, it's a foot right now. We're watching it all around us. Uh, and it is already affecting real-time weather forecasting, uh, both for NOAA forecasters and for our value-added partners in the broadcast uh, and weather enterprise, commercial weather enterprise. Okay. Can you share with us and the, the committee um, difficulties that are out there because of um, the IBM sale um, and your access to large data um, crunching and management? Uh, the, uh, the potential sale by IBM of their Lenovo unit is something that the Treasury Department is, is tracking closely, and I have to defer all questions about that particular sale to them. Uh, in terms of large data handling, uh, we have fronts, challenges on a couple of fronts. Our operational supercomputing that produces the production runs every three hours uh, is one that uh, we're on good track to come up to par with the Europeans on. Uh, we have our performance has lagged behind them on certain weather events, certainly not on all weather events over the past few years, predominantly because uh, our operational supercomputer uh, lagged behind theirs. So that one's catching up. Uh, when it comes to um, – sorry, I just lost my train of thought. No, it's, it's okay. It's, uh, I know some of this you do not control, and actually in many ways with my – fixation on crowdsourcing of access to, you may actually need substantially more um, capability in your computer side. Uh, I, I'm holding an article that was written by a researcher, I believe, in New York, and I haven't had, oh, sorry, University of Washington, forgive me, I'm, and I've only, it was only given to me as I was literally walking in the meeting, but um, the author of this is actually sort of uh, claiming that we've moved sort of down to fourth place in weather forecasting, accuracy, um, data collection. Um, any thoughts, any comments, or is it even something you've seen? I, I haven't seen it, so I wouldn't wish to comment on it. Okay. Um, my very last question I'm giving, I know I'm sliding over time. Um, as an agency, uh, you produce lots of rigorous scientific data, um, uh, proposals, mechanics. How do you do sort of your peer review on your methodology? Um, is it, do, do you continue with what you're doing, sort of a very open access to information? I'm, I'm just sort of curious if that's something that's hit your desk. Uh, it, it hits my desk and is on my radar screen very much because it goes to the heart of our commitment to scientific integrity and, and proper methods for assuring that. Uh, in the weather uh, and the climate domain, which, by the way, are just different timescales of the phenomena of this planet, uh, we are tightly interlaced with the best researchers globally, not just in the United States. The development of models nowadays is quite commonly, I'll uh, use a loose term, a, com a community playpen where various models are rigorously tested and compared by everybody. I'm not, I'm not even sure you would say loosely. That's my impression is it's all over the world now. Oh, it definitely is all over the world, and it's a very uh, robust, vibrant, challenging cross-comparison of models, of methods, of, of techniques. Do, do you believe NOAA continues to sort of um, adhere to that, that openness where it is a community of thought that is vetted but back and forth but accepts lots of inputs and, you know, accepts and rejects, you know, but, it, but is open to the debate? I believe we are very open to the debate around quality, rigorous scientific data and findings and judgments, absolutely. And, and forgive me for asking the question a bit ethereally. All right. And with that, um, Ms. Bonamici. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sullivan, for being here. I wanted to talk a bit about disaster preparedness and the importance of that uh, and, and focus on uh, the coastal environment where there's such enormous and potentially grave consequences. Uh, so I wanted to talk about two specific topics that you raised in your testimony, ocean acidification. Uh, the ocean is becoming more acidic as it absorbs excess carbon dioxide from the air, and this change has the potential to, among other things, uh, disrupt aquatic food webs. Uh, and in Oregon, the shellfish industry has already seen the harmful effects, and I want to point out that even for representatives who don't 
represent coastal communities, their constituents eat shellfish, and restaurants need it, and uh, it's, it's an important industry. Uh, the fishermen really dread what they might learn about damage to the food chain from ocean acidification. Uh, the budget request proposes an increase of $8.9 million for the ocean acidification program. So can you please discuss the need for that program and especially how NOAA is translating its research into practices and strategies that benefit the industry? Thank you for that question. This is really the, one of the silent, you know, creeping hazards uh, of our changing planet. Uh, NOAA seeks to better understand the processes and causes behind ocean acidification and in particular, as you point out, to develop methods that can translate our understanding and our monitoring of the natural environment into this thing I keep calling environmental intelligence, actionable and action-oriented, timely information that, as you know from your state, enables your constituents to manage the water intakes to their shellfish farm and protect their brood stock. So that is very much one of our key focal points in coastal resiliency generally. On the northwest coast, acidification is one of the principal risks. The Great Lakes in the Gulf of Mexico, harmful algal blooms uh, are also of concern. So how do we help coastal communities? How do we help provide them the information that beach managers, fishing managers, shell food proce shellfish processors can actually apply to keep their, their communities, their businesses, their families safe? Thank you. And, and also I wanted to talk about the Tsunami Warning and Education Act, which uh, we'll likely be considering, and I'm glad we're going to take that up. For uh, constituents up and down the coasts who grew up memorizing tsunami evacuation routes, this can't come soon enough. Uh, in that regard, I was concerned to see that the President's budget includes a reduction to education and awareness program grants under the National Tsunami Hazard Mitigation Program. Uh, how does NOAA intend to ensure uh, regional decision makers are able to develop and execute effective tsunami response plans without that grant program in place? Uh, well, first of all, let me thank you for your support for the reauthorization of the, the Tsunami Warning Education Act. That's a valuable piece of legislation that we do appreciate. Uh, with respect to the FY15 budget, uh, I also want to assure you that this in no way affects our principal responsibility, which is to provide those warnings and alerts that enable communities to take prompt action and get out of harm's way in the case of a tsunami. It does not affect the operability and the maintenance of the DART buoys, the key monitoring systems on the seafloor that feed that. It does not affect our uh, monitoring in collaboration with the U.S. Geological Survey that connects us to their seismic monitoring. It does not affect the, uh, the ongoing relationships and education uh, and connections between our National Weather Service folks and, and communities along the coast. Uh, regrettably, in the tight fiscal climate we're in, where we, we cannot, we don't have the means to advance all of the things we would wish to advance, we had slowed, we proposed in this budget to slow down to curtail the added grants that could expand the education footprint. Uh, but it, we're not curtailing the tsunami-ready community program that exists with existing communities. So our core responsibilities are unchanged. Uh, the rate of, some rate of progress is slowed down. Thank you. And I look forward to having that conversation when we take up that legislation. And, and on a related note, uh, I, I often discuss the importance of NOAA's research and outreach activities in, in the community. Uh, you know, our constituents understand that NOAA is doing its best with limited resources, but as you explained, uh, there's unmet need. But as you also acknowledge, uh, there are uh, fiscal challenges. So I was pleased to see the budget request to propose the 3 percent increase, but I was also dismayed that the House Appropriations Committee is proposing a 1 percent cut to the budget. So considering the unmet need for your agency's work, can you give the committee a brief idea of what a 1 percent funding cut compared to a 3 percent increase might mean for the work that you do and for our constituents? All right, it would take me more time than, than we have left to enumerate all the different service needs drought information, water planning information, um, El Nino, uh, refining the El Nino forecast so we can do a better job of helping California and the western states know in advance if the drought will break, when the pattern might shift, um, and bringing our high-performance computing up to par and keeping on the pace that we're currently on, which will put us back on par with the Europeans and anybody else and remove the, the bulk of whatever I suspect is, underlies the ranking that you have in that article. Weather, climate, understanding the ocean, uh, keeping pace and understanding fish stocks so that our coastal fishing communities have vital economies all across that front, there already are unmet needs. Thank you. And I'm going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, because the chair went just a little bit over, just, to, just ask, will you please focus on the importance of climate research to the work that you do? 
I would be delighted to focus on that. Uh, you know, Noah's, Noah exists to understand this planet and how it works and turn that information into useful, actionable information. Uh, that really requires us to understand across all of the time scales that the planet naturally has. So in NOAA, you know, weather is phenomena in the ocean and the atmosphere up to about two weeks in length, and climate is simply those same phenomena over longer time scales. So our ability, for example, to help those water managers that I was referring to in California or ranchers in the Southwest, help them know what's, what's their outlook for the next season for drought, that comes from understanding how the tropical Pacific climate system works on seasonal scales. That thing called El Nino, or scientifically, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Uh, being able to give the six-day outlooks that we gave to the, the South Central states in this most recent set of severe storms doesn't come from focusing harder on weather. It comes from having focused more richly on oceans and, and coupling that understanding with our understanding of the atmosphere. The range of information needs that American citizens and business have, businesses have is across a huge range of timescales. And if we aspire, as NOAA is chartered to do, to respond to those demands, to those really urgent needs across that whole range of scales, we have to be able to investigate and study and understand the many different timescales that are natural to this planet. To use a metaphor, we have to be able to play the whole keyboard if we're going to play the symphony that our communities are really asking us to play. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing uh, me to Thank you, Ranking to Member. Thank you. And Vice Chairman, Mr. Breinstein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for being here, Dr. Sullivan. It's uh, always a, a privilege to get a chance to talk to you. <clears throat> Wanted to uh, delve into the Ocean and Atmospheric Research Office, OAR, of course, the, uh, the research arm of NOAA. And it looks like the budget request uh, suggests uh, a request for another, an, an additional $31 million over last year. Is that correct? I believe that's the correct figure. And of that $31 million, uh, we're, we're, the request, the President's budget request, has a, a, a climate research subprogram increase of about $30.5 million. So the majority of OAR's budget request, the majority of the increase, in fact, the vast majority, 30.5 million out of 31 million, is for, is for climate research. Is that correct? Yes, specifically for improving the drought information products that we're providing to Western states. So I think about 11 of the states represented on this committee, in fact, are in something between severe and extreme drought right now. Uh, so again, that label climate in the NOAA budget um, means a certain thing. It means the information products that are pertinent to those longer time scales. The, uh, the National Weather Service in this budget request uh, under OAR is being cut by about $4 million. Is that correct? I don't have that detailed figure just in front of me. Well, well I have it here, and it's about $4 million. Okay. Um, the, the challenge is, and you're probably aware, we've had a number of deaths in Oklahoma and Arkansas over the last few days. And, and as you can imagine, uh, when, when the priority of NOAA is to save lives and property, which is what you've told us the priority is, and yet the research elements are going to climate research as opposed to what we know we can do, which is save lives and property today. We're doing this in the state of Oklahoma, which is the, the, the state I represent at, at the University of Oklahoma, the National Severe Storms Laboratory. We, we are able to prove that we can predict tornadoes over an hour in advance now. Um, and and not, not just predict, but we can warn people based on the forecast of a tornado over an hour in advance, and yet still, this week, people have died with less than a minute of lead time of warning. And all the research increase is going toward uh, climate change research and not towards weather forecasting and warning, which is where we know we can save lives and property. Uh, would you address uh, for the committee uh, your commitment to saving lives and property and explain how this budget request might do that? Our commitment to protecting lives and property runs across the entire scale of phenomena that, uh, that pose hazards to the lives and property of Americans, from the chronic conditions of drought that are devastating families and businesses across California and the Southwest right now to the Real quick, events. I'm going to interrupt here for a second. We have people that died this week that should have had more lead time than one minute. Are, do you agree with that? The statistics I have, sir, say that they had 20 to 29 minutes. There are people that did. There are people that got less. And, and if we were able to move the technologies in the direction where we could get over an hour of lead time, guess what? The people would have more heads up before the tornado hit their vehicle driving down the highway. Mr. Bridenstine, I 
completely share your desire to have greater lead time for people uh, in, in Tornado Alley. There are a number of things that we can and should do to, do to achieve that. One of them I would highlight for this committee that we've requested support for in this budget as well is to help us put the Weather Service on a path where it can, in fact, it has the flexibility to evolve and change and move forward more rapidly with technology changes and research advances. So helping us evolve the National Weather Service should be right up on top of that list if we want to really improve the services that we're giving to our people, and we certainly do. Roger that. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Brinstein. Ms. Edwards, five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Dr. Sullivan, for being here. And uh, thanks again for reminding us of the important work that the researchers, scientists, engineers, all of the staff at uh, NOAA, um, all the work that they, they do that keeps us all uh, safe. Uh, obviously, all of us would like to be uh, safer, and there's been no more stark reminder of the need uh, for NOAA uh, than the experiences of the last week and a half to two weeks. Um, and since everybody else did it, uh, congratulations again on the Time Magazine designation. want to make sure that's across the board here. Uh, I, want, I want to ask you about COSMIC-2. Uh, the budget request includes an increase of $4.8 million for ground reception and processing of COSMIC-2 satellite data provided by Taiwan and the United States Air Force. My understanding is that these data are not available from any other source. Can you just describe the value of the data and the impact um, that would happen for lose, from losing this capability? Uh, thank you, Mrs. Edwards. Uh, we're very much committed to the COSMIC-2 program. Uh, studies by the European Center for Mid-Range Weather Forecasting that have looked at the relative contribution to forecast accuracy and reliability of different kinds of data have demonstrated the value of COSMIC-2 data. Uh, this is, as you know, radio occultation data collected using GPS uh, satellite signals. Uh, this is very high quality data. Its reliability is very high. Uh, it's valuable in its own right, but interestingly, it actually also improves the value of the more precise sounding data that we get from our, our workhorse instruments on the polar satellites. Um, NOAA, as you point out, uh, proposes and requests funding in this budget to install the ground system that would let us process COSMIC-2 data. Uh, and that will be designed in a way that should there eventually ever be a decision made and a viable provider uh, to acquire radio occultation data in a different manner could take those data as well. So I would say two things. Um, we're, supported to cos we're very supportive of COSMIC-2. It's a tremendously cost-efficient way to go forward. It is right now the only proven viable capability uh, in hand to attain radio occultation data in the 2016 timeframe. And to the chairman's, uh, loop it back to the chairman's earlier question about actions that might help us if we did have, if we did have a gap in the polar satellites. Having COSMIC-2 on orbit providing those data uh, was highlighted in our independent report as one of the most effective things we could do to lessen the damage, lessen the degradation in forecast right. that such a gap would, cur would create. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, and then I want to go to the just the workforce a, a minute. NOAA's proposing a reduction of $10 million in the elimination of nine full-time uh, employees within the National Weather Service as part of a consolidation um, effort of technology support and services in six facilities. Uh, and, um, you know, there was a recommendation in the 2014 budget that was essentially rejected by the Senate with very specific uh, report language uh, that the committee did not possess the evidence um, that the National Weather Service has its workforce plan completely under control at this time, certainly not enough to propose further reductions without NOAA addressing why some positions remain unfilled or articulating what the proper staffing level is for field offices. I tend to agree um, with that sentiment expressed by Senate appropriators, especially in light of the proposed $3 million increase to support analysis of NWS uh, workforce and infrastructure. Also, I, I noticed that there is an increase of $12 million for corporate services. I don't even know what that is. Uh, so I want you to, if you would, to explain that, but then particularly explain how you're going to complete a timeline for filling the vacant weather forecasting uh, positions and why it is that we need to eliminate 98 uh, FTEs within uh, the National Weather Service. I'm not sure I can do that in 48 seconds. Well, try. 
We'll, uh, we'll give you 50. There you go. Oh, you're a gentleman and scholar, sir. Um, first, with respect to the information technology officers and the weather service, that, that proposal is not about the people. The ITOs are valuable employees. It is about improving the National Weather Service service delivery model and ensuring that we're making best use of government uh, resources. I've led technology-based businesses before, so has my boss, Secretary Pritzker. Uh, we both know that you're dead in the water if you stop innovating and evolving and keeping pace with the world. Uh, the fact is that our IT delivery model was developed in the age before the Internet and has been stagnant since then. Uh, regional IT service delivery is just plain out a proven industry and government best practice. Our current model is unsophisticated, outdated, and is not keeping up with the pace of technology change. National Academy of Public Administration told us, plain and simple, that we need to provide more robust, consistent nationwide services with regional teams, as a, and regional teams are a more appropriate way to do that. So that's on the ITO. Uh, we have backlogs of vacancies in many parts of NOAA, due largely to the unfortunate consequences of sequestration and the extreme responses, extreme consequences and actions that that forced all agencies to take, NOAA included. One of them that we were forced to take was an agency-wide hiring freeze, which throttled us back to only the most critical uh, hiring um, positions for the better part of a year. I was delighted to be able to lift that freeze at the end of January this year, but we still have to work our way out of that backlog. And that brings me slightly over the Chairman's time to your third point, why an increase in corporate services? That's the budget label for what I would call NOAA's back-of-house functions, Admi administrative services, grants, contracts, acquisition, and our human resources processing. So I've I'm one-third the capacity of many sister agencies. I'm 40 percent below the capacity of a, the average United States company on the fundamental capacity to make the cranks turn and perform the core functions of this organization. That's why I need to fortify my corporate services functions. That's what it will take to be sure that we can work through hiring actions like the ones that we need to work through for the weather service and the fishery service and the, and the ocean service. So it all does link together. It all is about letting this organization move forward, achieve organizational excellence, uh, and be flexible and adaptable to keep pace with the times and the growing and urgently growing and changing needs of our public. Ms. Thank, you. thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Then, thank you, Ms. Edwards. Uh, Mr. Warbucker. Uh, thank you very much. You know, we found that uh, contracting out uh, can actually save money for the government and thus have more funds uh, to accomplish the missions of government uh, if we let the private sector get involved. And, and for example, when SpaceX has saved us uh, already hundreds of millions of dollars by utilizing that uh, approach rather than just having the government uh, have launches. And um, NOAA is not uh, exempt from this uh, this rule, I meaning that perhaps um, uh, NOAA could be saving some money by purchasing, for example, sat uh, satellite data uh, to be used by NOAA and, and, and government users. And uh, has NOAA done uh, some an evaluation of that, and where do you stand in terms of uh, achieving the, uh, the, uh, the actual acquisition of private satellite data that would help us determine and reach your goals? Uh, it's a very important question, Mr. Rohrabacher, uh, and as I'm sure you know, we do purchase data from commercial vendors in a, in a number of arenas, including the weather arena right now. Uh, we're not opposed categorically uh, to commercial data from satellites, uh, but I, I would make a few points. One is because of the criticality the, the daily, everyday criticality of the weather enterprise to the safety of this nation, uh, we believe we need to uh, adopt the mountain climbers rule with respect to making switches, and that is let go of the current handhold only when you really have firm grasp on the next handhold. Uh, as you know, that's also, that mimics the astronaut's rule of never let go of one tether until you got that other one attached. Um, right now, there are no proven viable commercial uh, entities 
Uh, and I talk about, I mean, people who can show proof positive, not a really spiffy PowerPoint presentation we, about we, their ability to deliver. Have we provided deliver. any incentives for the private sector to invest in this area? Uh, I'm not aware of any commercial incentives that we have provided, but we don't have the kind of uh, budget structures or uh, accounts uh, that would really let us do that. We have a clear clear policies, clear ground rules. The National Weather Service has 16 long-standing criteria uh, for data quality. Uh, we buy uh, instrumentation and data from uh, vendors that can demonstrate that they can meet those constraints. I would add one other point, though. I think there's another dimension that's very important for us to keep in mind in this, in this specific case. Your general point about public-private interaction I take, but in this specific case, the United States commercial weather enterprise is founded on the premise that the foundational data that produce, that are the feedstock for NOAA's forecasts are a public good. The downstream economic benefits garnered off of those data are very, very real and quite considerable. There are over 300 private weather companies today that use those data as feedstock. There's no other weather enterprise on the planet that takes that model of a private innovation platform in the data as a public yeah. good and produces the private sector value-added economic activity on the downstream. Mm -hmm. I would urge before we rush to commercial data sources, just in particular to ease short-term funding pressures, that we, and I mean NOAA and this committee, uh, other relevant bodies of the Congress and stakeholders, that we evaluate carefully and really think through the impacts, the intended and the unintended impacts that might come from monetizing the data stream, which I think might well constrict that rich innovation we have in 300 private sector companies currently, uh, rather than continuing to if treat the, it as a public good. Uh, that's uh, uh, an interesting admonition, and I will. Uh, I think that we should be working on that concept to see if we can come up with a formula that meets uh, the criteria you just mentioned. One, uh, another area, um, then this, this goes back to some of the fundamental differences that we have here on, on fundamental issues. And um, Vice President Al Gore, uh, former Vice President Al Gore, recently said in an interview that extreme weather events are 100 times more common today than they were 30 years ago due to global warming and also stated that these events are getting more frequent. Um, are extreme weather events 100 times more common today uh, than 30 years ago due to global warming? And are they getting to be more frequent? Uh, it seems that we've had other people testifying and other experts suggesting that that's not true. I am, Mr. Rohrabacher, I'm not uh, conversant enough with those statistics off the top of my head to want to attempt to give you detailed answers. I will certainly get back to you uh, on that. I do know that our best scientists uh, within NOAA are very very cautious and leery about attributing specific extreme weather events to climate change per se. There, as right. I've been referring to, so many patterns uh, and so many time scales interacting to produce the phenomena that we experience on Earth. The challenge of attribution is a very difficult one. Right. You know, I sat through uh, Hurricane Hazel back in 1956 and uh, uh, I lived in North Carolina. My father was a Marine. We lived at Camp Lejeune. Mm -hmm. And I remember that, that event very vividly. And I was surprised to find out that, uh, and am I correct, that Hurricane Hazel was actually more powerful than Hurricane Sandy, although the, the actual uh, damage that was caused was less uh, because uh, Sandy happened to have come with a number of factors rather than just the one weather factor. Well, I'll get back to you on the actual recorded hurricane intensity of Hazel because you don't want me saying how old I was at that time. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the damages caused are certainly changing as the population density and the built infrastructure in coastal zones changes over time. Right. So, Well, thank you very much and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Dana, or Mr. Warbacher. And we would never ask that, but we are going to tease Dana about 1956. So just plan on that. <laughs> And I, uh, I, I want to thank Dr. Sullivan for her valuable testimony and the members for their questions and comments. Um, the members of the committee may have additional questions for you. 
um, and we will provide those to you in writing. The record will remain open for two weeks for those additional comments and questions um, from the members. And with that, witnesses excused, and the hearing is closed. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman.